Father, we thank you so much for uh, this, this morning. I thank you for every single person that's here. And uh, Lord, we just pray that, that we as a people, Lord, uh, as your people, can be uh, salt and light in this world. Lord, that we can be people who, who want more than anything to serve you with our lives. So, Father, we pray that you'll speak to us this morning from your word, that you'll move us to the kinds of action that you want us to take. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, back when the earth's crust was forming and we first started having babies, you know, in the Jemison household, you know, they didn't have sonograms. Second and third baby they did, but first, they didn't have sonograms. I mean, we, the first time we got to see our baby was when he was born. Boom. Oh, that's what he looks like, okay? But, but we, we could read books about the stages of development and see all that was fine, but we couldn't actually see anything. My, how things have changed, Right? Now I've seen all kinds of sonogram pictures. I've seen sonogram pictures of my own grandson, Oliver, and, and we've been seeing Jordy and Megan's little sonograms of their little baby that Megan's getting ready to have, and countless others. And my wife, Julie, actually had the privilege of going with Patton and Lisa and Lauren and seeing the 3D sonogram of their baby. It was, oh, oh look, he's got Patton's nose unbelievable stuff. It's just unbelievable. And seeing these little live human beings developing so incredibly inside the mother's womb, it's nothing short of spectacular, guys. It just blows you away because it reveals so clearly, so very, very clearly, the startling reality of the miracle of the birth of little babies. Now, Got a real treat for you to help us all appreciate this amazing miracle of God. I'd like for us to watch this like a, like a three-and-a-half-minute video called The Miracle of Life. Let's watch it. Bring down the lights down. Let's watch it. Wow. Let's give God a hand for that. Okay. Well, seeing that miracle and just seeing how God is so delicately forming these little babies within their mother's wombs... <sighs> Guys, that's what makes these recent videos of Planned Parenthood so profoundly disturbing. As many of you know, a whole series of these videos have been released a little at a time over the last month, and the most recent one being last Wednesday. And for, for those of you who have not had an opportunity to watch these videos, I promise you we're not going to show them today, but as your pastor, I encourage you with all my heart, watch them if at all possible. Yes, these videos are heart-wrenching. Yes, these videos are terribly disturbing. Yes, they're very hard to watch, but you and I as Christ followers, we need to understand, guys, we need to understand what is occurring every single day all over the country in these Planned Parenthood clinics. Listen to what your tax dollars are paying for. In some of the earlier videos, we see senior Planned Parenthood officials laughing and sipping Chardonnay in a restaurant and callously, coldly, heartlessly bartering and selling body parts of aborted babies. In one of the videos, a senior Planned Parenthood official says that she wants to sell so many body parts to un of unborn children that she'll have enough money to, to buy a Lamborghini. In a more recent video, perhaps the most horrific one. You see a lab technician who's being interviewed, and this lab technician is describing a, a little aborted baby boy whose heart is still beating, and yet she has been instructed to insert scissors under the chin of that infant child, cut open his face with the scissors, and remove his brain while the heart is still beating. Now, guys, those are words that are just hard to even say out loud. It's just so nauseatingly horrific. But we need to know. We need to know that this kind of thing is happening all over our country day after day after day after day. And our government is supporting it to the tune of $500 million, which we pay each year to fund planned it's a multi-million dollar industry. 
Wednesday, a video was released of the CEO of a company that was buying the uh, aborted, dismembered baby parts from Planned Parenthood, and they're explaining that abortion is a volume business. In other words, we need a lot of baby parts in order for us to make money. In another video, when a prospective buyer of body parts uh, was asked, uh, you know, asked the Planned Parenthood official what would make her happy, she just smiled as well. Oh, Fifty more baby livers, that would make me happy. Fifty more a week, that's what, that would make me happy. So we're seeing unborn children, aborted babies, treated as business commodities with their body parts being sold. Now these videos are repulsive, but let me tell you again, I want to reiterate, they're important. They're important because what they do for us is that they reveal the callous disregard for human life that routinely goes on in uh, the abortion clinics at Planned Parenthood. They expose Planned Parenthood's barbaric and illegal, it's criminal what they're doing, illegal uh, practices of harvesting the body parts of innocent babies and selling them to the highest bidder. You know, I was supposed to preach today uh, part two of Transforming Our Work series, but God apparently had other plans. Amen. Wednesday, uh, I was invited to, to listen in with 100,000 other pastors to a teleconference with a, a United States senator, and, uh, and we're listening to all of this stuff that's going on at Planned Parenthood. And we were urged to prayerfully consider preaching a message today on this topic, on this massacre of these unborn children, and I felt led to, to do just that. Now, before we get started, let me say this. I realize this is a very sensitive topic, and it is very possible that some of you sitting here, maybe nobody else knows that, but you know about it, but somebody, some of you sitting here may have had an abortion at some point in your past, and if I'm talking to you, please, please, Please know that my purpose in addressing this topic this morning is not to condemn you and make you feel horribly guilty. That is not what this church is about. We are all about sharing God's grace. We're not all about sharing God's condemnation. Everybody has heard John 3.16. We know that. I don't even have to say it. You know that one. But how about John 3.17, the very next verse? You know what it says? For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Did you hear that? Jesus didn't come here to condemn you. Oh, you're doing that, you're that, you're going to hell. No, he came, I'm coming to save you, to save you. A few chapters over in John chapter 8, there's a group of Pharisees trying to trap Jesus, and they grab this woman whom they catch in the very act of adultery, drag her out of the bedroom, bring her in front of Jesus, and throw him at his feet. And he said, hey, Moses says we're supposed to stone this woman to death. What do you think, Jesus? And you know what he said. He said, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And one by one, beginning with the oldest and then the youngest, one by one, all the condemners left. And after they had gone, Jesus turns to her and asks, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And Jesus says, Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, if you're a believer in Christ, if you have trusted Christ with the forgiveness of all of your sins, you will never, ever be condemned for any of your sins, including the sin of abortion. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you've had an, ab an abortion, I, I am telling you, my heart goes out for you, to you. I, I, I can't even begin to imagine how hard the weight of that must be to carry. But I want you to know that there is complete forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that he loves you so much that he is willing to die for all of your sins and all of my sins. Why don't we just bow our heads right now? Everybody just please bow your head. Listen, if you came in here this morning all loaded down with guilt about your sins, abortion, or any other, other sin that you might have done in the past, and you would like to be relieved of that pressing weight, that burden of guilt, you can do that right now. 
And here's what you do. Just silently where you are sitting, talk to God and say, God, thank you for bringing me here today. God, you know my sins, all of them. You know the guilt I'm still carrying around for something I did many years ago. So God, I come to you now and I want you to know that I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe that he is your son and he died on the cross to pay for all of my sins, even the one that's making me feel so bad right now. So God, I'm asking you to just come on into my life and be my Lord and Savior. God, I want to live my life for you. Thank you, God, that I don't have to feel guilty about my sins any longer. Thank you, Jesus, that, that when you were up there on the cross, thank you for carrying the weight of my sin so that I don't have to carry it anymore. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now look up here. If you prayed that prayer, boy, it's real important that you tell somebody about it. And so, the, so we, and it, me, the church staff, and the elder, deacon, your friends who brought you here, that they can begin to help you to, in this exciting journey of, of living your life for Jesus Christ. And uh, if you'd still, you know, this is a, a very serious, unsettling thing. If you'd still like to talk about some of these issues, I, I'm, nothing would please Robert and me more than to be having an opportunity to sit down with you at, at church this next week and, and just talk about some of these things. And also we've got... Becky Dufrin, who's a, a, a Christian counselor, who's every Monday, you can make an appointment with her, and she could help you work through some of these things uh, as well. So, the purpose of this message, again, is not to condemn. The purpose of this message is to inform, to inform. The purpose of this message is for us to look into God's Word and gain a biblical perspective on abortion. And seeing what abortion really is, I hope that we as a church body will be moved to take some action to do whatever we can to drastically reduce the number of abortions, abortions which take place in this country. I said 50 million in the first service. I, I was corrected. It's now 57 million senseless deaths of unborn children. Folks, that's enough. This has to stop. So in the time remaining, I'd like to look into God's Word with you and consider three things. One, why abortion is wrong. Two, how we as Christ followers are to respond. And three, what can we do to try to stop this modern-day holocaust? So to begin with then, why is abortion so terribly wrong? Well, first of all, because God is the creator of life. Now that, that video we saw, boy, was that ever evident. And perhaps the most eloquent, the most revealing passage of Scripture which describes God's role in creating life within the mother's womb is Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. And I love the way the, the New Living Testament translates this, so let me read that to you. And it's up on the screen as well. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, David is right saying this, and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark, darkness of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Let me tell you a true story. True story about a young couple in Texas. The husband was there. He was going to grad school, and his wife was there, and she was preparing to become a teacher. And after a few months, the wife began to have some severe pain in her stomach. So going to an internist, he concluded, after all the testing, that she was not pregnant. So he did a full series of abdominal x-rays to try to see what the problem was going on in her stomach. It turned out that the doctor was wrong. She, in fact, was two months pregnant. The very worst time to have x-rays is at two months pregnancy. So her gynecologist strongly recommended that she have an abortion, telling this, this young woman that the chances were very, very high that, that her baby would be horribly, severely deformed. 
Well, that couple, they were Christians, and they, they prayed about this and just didn't know what to do, but they, they finally decided not to have the abortion. And seven months later, the little child was born. He was a perfectly healthy baby boy, and that couple decided to name him William Deering Jemison IV. What changed our minds to not have an abortion? Listen, back then, you know, Julie and I, we'd never heard anything from the Bible about abortion. I mean, it just wasn't something people talked about a whole lot. We we thought it was just a medical procedure, you know, you just did no big deal. We hadn't gone to churches that preach expository messages from the Word of God. So not knowing any better, let me tell you, we were seriously considering having our baby aborted. But then, as uh, I was happening to be going to Dallas Seminary at the time, we learned from, from the Word of God, my boy, just how wrong abortion is. And the major, major passage of Scripture that just drove this, this, this thing home, that God is a creator of life, is this passage I just read, Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. Look at that again together. It's clearly God who is performing this sublime miracle of the creation of human life. It's not simply an impersonal biological process going on in there. No, God himself, he's the one who with great care, with great design, with great purpose, is causing all of this marvelous stuff to go on. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You, God, knit me together in my mother's womb. Guys, let's not fool ourselves. This is not any embryonic blob. This is no impersonal fetal tissue. It is a human being created by God. And this, guys, this is really the crux of the whole abortion issue. Because if that which is uh, uh, within the womb of a pregnant woman, if it's just merely an impersonal glob of fetal tissue, then abortion, hey, it is just a medical procedure. That's it. But if that which is in the womb of a pregnant woman is in fact a living human being, then abortion is murder. It's murder. And that's why the pro-abortion people are so, 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 so very careful to refer to the life within a pregnant woman as a fetus instead of as a baby. But do you know what the word fetus actually means? It's actually a Latin word. And guess what it means? Unborn child. Unborn child. But fetus is the term usually used because if somebody wants to take the life of an unborn human being and not feel too guilty and too bad about it, they need to strip that tiny baby of all of its worth and all of its dignity. And they need to give it, it's never called a he or a she, or, they give it a clinical name that denies its personhood. They, they need to call the baby a fetus. Look at another passage in uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And God says to Jeremiah, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. See what that's saying? God knew Jeremiah once he was born. No, it doesn't say that. He knew Jeremiah before he was born. Jeremiah didn't become a real person at the time of his birth. No, God knew about him. God set him apart. God appointed him to be a prophet before he was born, while he was developing inside his mother's womb. So clearly then, Jeremiah's life was real, and, and it was human and eternally significant to God while he was still in his mother's womb. He was not fetal tissue. He was a person. He was Jeremiah. You know, medical evidence certainly supports the fact that unborn babies are human beings. You know, consider this following description of an unborn child given by Dr. A.W. Liley. And he is a world-renowned research professor of fetal physiology. I mean, he's an expert in how babies develop. Listen to what he says. Biologically, at no stage can we subscribe to the view that the fetus is a mere appendage of the mother. Genetically, mother and baby are separate individuals from conception. By 18 days, the developing heart starts beating the first strokes of a pump that will make 3,000 million beats in a lifetime. 
by 30 days, a quarter of an inch long. He has a brain of unmistakable human proportions, eyes, ears, mouth, kidneys, liver, an umbilical cord, and a heart pumping blood that he has made himself. By 45 days, the baby's skeleton is complete, and he makes the first movements of his body and new grown limbs, although it will be another 12 weeks before mother notices the movements. By 63 days, nine weeks, he will grasp an object placed in his palm and can make a fist. We know that he moves with a delightful, easy grace in his buoyant world. He is responsive to pain and touch and cold and sound and light. He drinks his amniotic fluid more if it's artificially sweetened, less if it's given an unpleasant taste. He gets hiccups and sucks his thumb. He wakes and sleeps. He gets bored with repetitive signals, but can be taught to be alerted by a first signal for a second different one. From this and all other scientific information, we are compelled to recognize that at no stage of our development were we only potential human beings who magically came to life at birth. At the fetal stage, we were individuals just as we are now, alive and active, aware of ourselves and our environment, but growing and developing faster than we ever would again. Even our personality was well underway then, and it is one we carry into our infancy and ultimately adulthood. Clearly then, From both medical and biblical evidence, a young pregnant mother is carrying in her womb a living human being. And so abortion is not simply a harmless, insignificant termination of her pregnancy. No, abortion is the murder of a divinely created human being. So that's one reason why it's so terrible. Terribly wrong. Another reason abortion is so terribly wrong, B on your outline, is because God hates the shedding of innocent blood. God hates the shedding of innocent blood. You know, in the book of Proverbs, God inspires King Solomon, you know, David's son, uh, to specifically spell out seven things. Seven things that God especially hates. We like to think of God as God of love, and he certainly is. But you know, as a righteous God, there's some things he hates too. And in Proverbs 6, uh, he says this, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Now, number three on that list is hands that shed innocent blood. Now, you tell me, what could possibly be more innocent than an unborn baby? He or she has never done one thing wrong. They may have a sin nature, but they've never done one thing wrong. He or she did not ask to be conceived. It wasn't their idea. And he or she is totally helpless to defend himself or herself from the surge and scalpel. You know, they're pretty innocent. Or how about Psalm 106, where the psalmist is reviewing the history of the Jewish people, and he's reviewing a certain part where they did this boneheaded thing. They turned away from God and started worshiping these stupid false gods. Listen to what's happening when they did that. Verse 37, Psalm 106. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters as false gods. Jewish people, they were were killing their children on altars to to Baal and all kinds of Moloch and all these weird, awful, ridiculous gods. And it says this, they shed innocent blood. The blood of their sons and daughters whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was desecrated by their blood. They defiled themselves by what they did. Guys, God hates, he hates the shedding of innocent blood. It's something that just just grieves the very heart of God. And today when people abort their own baby sons and daughters, bowing down to our modern-day idols of free choice, selfish lifestyle, and convenience, it tears God up. He hates the innocent, the shedding of innocent blood. So, how should we, as Christ followers, respond? 
And the answer is, we need to do something. We need to be spurred on to take action. Proverbs 15, verse 9 says, The Lord abhors the ways of the wicked, but listen to this, but He loves those who pursue righteousness. And that's what we need to do, guys. We need to pursue righteousness. And we need to take the right course of action. We need to do something about this. You see, it's not enough to feel badly. It's just not. It's not enough to watch these Planned Parenthood uh, videos and see these uh, babies who are being aborted and dismembered and har- their body parts harvested. It's not enough to see all that and just, oh, isn't that awful? That's terrible. I just feel so badly inside. That's not enough. We've got to do something. We got, God wants us to respond with action. To 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, talks about two kinds of sorrow, godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Now, here's what it was talking about. Godly sorrow is like this. You do something wrong, and you feel very badly about it, and you repent. You change. You take action to make that situation better. Here's worldly sorrow. It starts off the exact same way. You do something wrong. Oh, you feel terribly about it, but you do nothing. You take no action. You make no changes. You just feel bad about it and have your own little pity party, and the situation just doesn't get any better at all. Listen to me. Listen to me. We cannot afford to be do-nothing Christians because you and I, you know what? We need to be salt and light for the world. And the reason we need to be salt and light in the world is Jesus tells us to be. In Matthew 5, Jesus turns to his followers and says, Guys, I hate to break it to you, but listen up. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, many, most of y'all know this, but salt in the ancient world was a preservative. It wasn't so much to kind of flavor your eggs. No, it was more a preservative. They didn't have refrigerators, so they would salt meat down, especially to keep that meat from rotting, to keep that meat from corroding. Now, as salt, if we're the salt of the world, that means that we are to function in this world as God's preserving agents, his men. His women who are here to preserve our world from complete and utter moral decay. And we're here. We're supposed to stand up for what is right. We're here to stand up for what is godly. And guys, I can think of no more important area in our time when we need to be salt more than in this horror, this this abomination, this monstrous evil of what's going on every single day in these Planned Parenthood clinics and the whole abortion industry. You know, historians pretty much agree that one of the most horrific periods of history in the world was when Hitler was trying to take over the world. And the most evil thing he did was to imprison and torture and murder six million Jews. You want to hear something really sad? Really sad? For the most part, the church in Germany did nothing about it. They just put their heads in the sand and just hoped the whole thing would go away. And many of the churches in that day, they just caved in. Do you know that they actually let Nazis come in and tell them how to run their churches? Unbelievable. But there were a few amazing exceptions, one of which was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Bonhoeffer, maybe you've read his book, The Cost of Discipleship, but he was a German, a courageous Christian man who stood up to the Nazis. And he spoke out against the atrocities of Hitler and his Nazi uh, crew. And eventually, of course, he was thrown into a concentration camp. And horrible things were done to him there, and he was hung. Bonhoeffer, as a Christ follower, he, he didn't think he had a choice just to sit there and do nothing in the face of the atrocity. He, he did What? Well, I, I can't just sit here and, and see this go on and say nothing about it. 
And he has this great statement. He's got this little uh, picture here, and it says this. This is what Bonhoeffer said. He says, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to speak, that's to speak. Not to act, oh, that's acting. Do you hear that? Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Well, guys, we're facing a holocaust today that's much larger than the one Hitler did. He murdered six million people, but ever since 1973, Roe v. Wade, the the, the blood of 57 million innocent babies has been shed. So will we simply be like the German church and kind of turn our heads, you know, and just kind of ignore this American holocaust that's going on in Planned Parenthood clinics every single day? Here's a question I want just to haunt you this week. Will we remain silent in the face of evil? Or will we roll up our sleeves and do something? The question is, is there anything we can do to help stop the atrocities of the atrocious activities of Planned Parenthood? Well, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of things. I don't know you, some of you already are doing things, but here are two things, two things that I want every single one of us to do in the next couple of weeks. First of all, in a few weeks, in, in September, you know, the United States of Congress are returning back to Washington, D.C., and they are going to vote in this session whether or not to fund Planned Parenthood. And one very specific, one very practical, one very doable thing that you and I can do in response to this horror that's going on is to call or write our congressmen and our senators. And just let them know. Let them know that we are very upset by all the abortions going on and the, and the, the criminal actions of, of harvesting body parts of dismembered aborted babies. And then we strongly urge them, please, please, please defund planned Parenthood. Elected officials tell us that when a large number of constituents, you know, start phoning in, they listen. If it's a few trickle in, well, you know, it's not that big. All millions of people, millions of people start phoning in, they start listening because these are voters, okay? As I mentioned earlier, 100,000 pastors were invited to this phone conference, and if the Christian men and women in those churches or those pastors light up the phone banks and they, they call their congressmen, they call their senators, I'm telling you guys, this is an opportunity to have a powerful impact. Uh, And as the number of calls, man, they just start growing and growing. It's not just over one day. It's over two weeks. And as the collective voice of God's people in this country get louder and louder, it can be a powerful force in helping Congress to decide to do the right thing. Now, on your outline, I provided all the names and the phone numbers and the fax numbers and the emails of our senators. Of course, Senator David Vitter, he got his information there. And we've got Senator Bill Cassidy, got his information. And our Congressman Representative Steve Scalise got his information. Now, you can call others, but these guys are going to listen because these are the guys whom you are voting for, okay? They will listen. Now, according to the senator, uh, the way for this vote uh, that they're going to have to have teeth is for the defund the Planned Parenthood proposal to be tied together with this continuing resolution to fund the government. So when you call, it's important to mention that as well. Now, notice that I've, I've included see Congress merge hints for communicating uh, with Congress. And that's this little sheet that's in your bulletin. It looks like that. Okay, and this, this is great. And this is on this website. And, and please, please, listen, don't call. Don't write until you read this, okay? Because it has some great, excellent suggestions that can make all the difference in the world. Listen, if you're, doing, if you're going to make this phone call or email just to make you feel better, well, go ahead, don't, don't read it, just do it. If you want your vote to count, you want your call to count, read this. And this way, they will listen to you. They will take your, your comments and your opinions seriously. In other words, don't call it, y'all are the biggest bunch of bums in Washington. I can't believe you're doing this. You're all pagan. You're going to hell. I can't believe you're aborting babies. That's not going to, they're just going to click, okay? No, we need to be civil. We need to be passionate but respectful, okay? It talks about that. 
Okay, so guys, we've got a window of opportunity. You know, a two-week period, this window is closing. Tomorrow the window will be a little, little closer, a little closer. We've got a window of opportunity, a moment in time when we as believers can stand together and we can do something which may well have be very influential in shutting down this abortion mill of planned parenthood. So guys, I want to encourage you all now, hold each other accountable. Hey, did you make a call yet? No, have you made your call yet? Yeah, I'm going to do it today. Jump into action this week and the next week and make those phone calls. Don't be silent in the face of easel, evil. Make the call. The second thing we can do to make a huge difference is to participate in a day of prayer and fasting. Again, on this uh, phone, uh, phone conference, it was, it was recommended that we, we establish September the 9th, a Wednesday, to be uh, a day of prayer and fasting, which Christians all over the country will reunite together and pray that, that our voices can be heard. And it just happens that that's the second Wednesday of the month, which just happens to be our regularly scheduled uh, evening of prayer. So I hope we'll pray and fast, and you can fast from TV or food or whatever you want to. And then come together at the evening service from, from 7 to 8 p.m. And let's, let's unite our hearts in prayer. Samuel Chadwick said uh, something you've probably heard before, but it's so true. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. You know what? The devil does not want us to pray about defunding Planned Parenthood. He knows. He knows a lot better than we do uh, that, that how powerful this thing we call prayer really is. You know, in John 8, 44, Jesus talks about the devil. And you know what he says about the devil? He says this. He was a murderer from the beginning. A murderer. You know what that means? It means, since that's true, that we can know that the evil one delights in the murder of millions and millions and millions of unborn. But it thrills him. So let's join forces, guys, September the 9th, and not let him have his way. Let's unite together and pray for Planned Parenthood to be defunded and shut down. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the life that you've given us. Eternal life, Lord, that that begins now and continues forever, all because of what your son Jesus did on the cross. And Father, uh, a big part of us wishes you just take us right on home to be in heaven right now. We We would love that, Father. But you have chosen to leave us here. You've chosen to leave your servants here on earth so that we could be your hands and feet, so that we could be salt and light, so that we could lead others to Christ and that we could make a difference in this decaying world of ours. Father, we just confess, Lord, the horror of what, what, what our nation has condoned. 57 million babies gone. And Father, we pray that, we, that for each one of us, Lord, that we won't just feel badly about it, Lord, but that we will also take action. That we'll pick up our cell phones and take five minutes to call these guys. That we will take the time out of our busy, busy schedules and come here on September the 9th from 7 to 8 to lift up voices and prayers to, to you, our loving Heavenly Father, and just beseech you and implore, just storm the gates of heaven that you will lead these congressmen and these senators to do the right thing. And we pray this, Father, in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.